Hi, this is AC's 8-Bit Zone. This episode is about sprites and moving from basic to assembly language to increase graphics performance. In this series, we'll see some software sprites, hardware sprites, and video game making. Subscribe and click the bell if you'd like to receive a notice when my next video comes available. In the previous episode, we created an animation in BASIC using GET and PUT. We tried both ways of using them, one way for speed and the other for accuracy. About the best we could do is what you are seeing here. This is fine for slower speed animation, but let's see what we can do about the problem using assembly language. Assembly language will be assembled into machine language and will run on bare metal. In other words, there will not be an operating system between our program and the CPU. There will not be any basic interpretation happening behind the scenes. Under the hood, BASIC is using machine language as well. But the problem is that the machine language has to waste a lot of time reading through our BASIC text to determine what commands to invoke. Another problem that we'll solve is one called tearing. See how the vertical block sometimes appears with the top and bottom halves out of phase? like it's been torn in half. It's because the program was in the middle of erasing and redrawing the object in video memory when the video memory was captured and sent to the display. When the raster line passes through our object, we're seeing new data above and old data below. We'll sync to the vertical refresh timing to avoid that problem. Let's get started. Here's the program structure. We begin with the starting address for our code at hexadecimal address 6000. The end of the main loop will be here at end main. I've placed the state variables for our sprite just after the main loop. State variables remember the values from one pass of the main loop to the next. They're things like the x and y coordinates of the sprite, the previous coordinates of the sprite, and maybe the current direction of motion like up, down, left, right. The next include statement places the sprite in data memory. Remember how there were four versions of our sprite, or four phases? There's an array of 45 bytes of sprite data for each phase of the sprite. We have these prepared in advance to increase the speed of the animation. The trade-off is that more program memory is required, but the benefit is worth the cost, because moving the sprite will be quicker. Now back to the beginning of the code. First, we set the P mode, clear the graphics screen, and draw the blue maze in the background. These LBSR statements are long branch to subroutines. Second, we will initialize state variables, things like the X and Y position of the sprite. This is the start of our main loop, so we save the sprite position YCXC in YOLD XOLD. Notice that the code is being efficient handling these as 16-bit operations. Next, we'll read the joystick to look for a direction request. And yes, the joystick is going to control the motion of the sprite. The direction of motion is another pair of state bytes, dy and dx. Just after that, we'll look toward the requested direction to see if there's a maze wall in the way of our character. If not, we'll take that requested direction as the command. And if there was no direction input from the joystick, meaning that the joystick was left in the center, then we'll look in the direction we were previously traveling. And if there's no wall in the way, we'll keep going that original direction. If there's no input from the joystick and we run into a wall, that's okay. We can just stop Pac-Man and, and leave that sprite stationary. This is done by zeroing the DX and DY values. That's the same mechanics as in the original game of Pac-Man. With that final decision on the direction of motion, the program will now update the sprite's location. We load YC and XC into the A and B registers. Then add the direction values DY and DX respectively. The direction values are either zero, plus two, or minus two so that the sprite will move only two bits at a time. And remember how each pixel is made up of two bits? And this way Pac-Man will only move in, in one pixel increments. At this point, all our calculations are ready, and all that's left to do is update the display memory. 
Here is where we will prevent tearing. We'll insert a weight delay loop to synchronize with the VDG's drawing pace. That's the video display generator. All the instruction cycles so far will fit into less time than the time it takes for the VDG to draw the previous screen. So there will be some idle cycles here. Once we know we're in between screen redraws, we can erase the display memory at the old sprite location and redraw the sprite in the new display memory location. Then I put in a couple of convenience instructions that check to see if the user is pressing a key. This provides a breakpoint so the program can be interrupted without having to reset the Coco. And we finally loop back to the beginning. Here's the code for drawing the sprite. We know the center coordinates of the sprite are YC and XC. YC runs from 0 to 191 and XC from 0 to 255. You know, one of the most annoying parts of this program was the point SC, the, the point screen routine. It converts the center coordinates to the display memory address of the first byte of the sprite. You know, where we need to start drawing the sprite in display memory. Here's how that has to work. We need to translate from this point here near the center of the sprite up to a byte address up here in the upper left corner. So we go up seven rows and we go left nine bits. And this translation will work for all four phases of the sprite within the byte. The other three phases are shifted left by two, four, or six bit positions. So this minus nine operation will land inside the first byte in all four of those scenarios. Now to get the byte address, we start with these translated values of X and Y. Every count of Y is worth 32 bytes of display memory because there are 32 bytes per row. Every eight counts of X is worth one byte of display memory. So we need Y times 32 and X divided by eight. We come into the subroutine here with the YCXC coordinates in the A and B registers. We do an XC minus nine to translate to the left by two bytes, then divide that by eight to convert bit counts to bytes. Then with in the B register, we do a YC minus seven to translate upward seven rows. Then we divide that no, then we multiply that by 32. See the two LEAY statements? Load effective address in the Y register. So we entered the routine with the Y register holding the starting address of display memory. So offset zero. The first LEAY adds register B to Y, which accounts for the horizontal offset of bytes. Then the second LEAY adds D to Y. That accounts for the vertical offset of bytes. We return from the subroutine with Y now pointing to the first byte in display memory. Whew. Erasing and drawing the sprite are very similar operations and they share much of the code. One difference is that draw points to the current position YCXC, but erase points to the old position YOXO. Both operations call the point screen sub that we talked about to point to the sprite location in display memory. Both call get shift, which determines which of the four offsets within the byte. The only difference in clear sprite and draw sprite is the masking operator. It's a logical OR for draw sprite and a logical XOR for clear sprite. In other words, we set bits to draw, and we invert bits to clear. If you remember back from part one where there was an inverse mask that we ended with the display memory, well, we're taking a shortcut here. Since I knew that the background under the sprite was already clear, there was no background maze walls underneath them, I was able to use the same mask for erasing as I did for drawing. The XOR operator inverts any bits that were set during the draw operation, which has the effect of clearing only the bits of the sprite. You could still use AND and OR operations if you choose, but you'll also need an inverted mask plus the sprite mask. That would have taken a little more memory. OK, 
Okay, now it's time to see the final product. I'm gonna switch over from the real monitor to the video card in just a minute, but I want you to first see the smoothness on the actual monitor because my video capture adds a little bit of choppiness to the, to the video stream. So here we go. Yeah, it, this is really fast. This is faster than a normal game of Pac-Man. It's, uh, it's very responsive. Uh, even though I'm, I'm going really fast, I feel like I have pretty good control with Pac-Man. And a couple of notes here on the screen. There's an idle bar over here that's showing how long we're idling during the V-Sync wait. So you can see that jittering a little bit as we, as the coding load changes depending on where we are in the maze. And yeah, it's just very smooth. Uh, one other thing is I'm showing you this on Coco Digital Video. If you haven't already seen my video on that, you might want to check that out. So I'm going to go click the button on the Coco DV card and we're going to cycle through the, uh, the artifact modes. So we just left rich artifacts and this is monochrome. And this is the other color set. And oh, this is a good one, fat bits. So uh, this, this should give you a good view of, of everything and double wide pixels. I, I like this sometimes. This is a good mode to look at things. Yeah, this feels really good. This has good controllability. And at regular slower speed, I think this would be much easier to control. And of course, we're slowing down for V-Sync here. And we could actually go faster if we remove the uh, V-Sync. But of course, then it would just be completely <laughs> uncontrollable. This is this is good as it is. Okay, now I've switched back to the video capture card. And you'll probably be able to see this choppiness in the final video. Uh, the, the capture process adds just a little bit of jitter. Because I have a, a really cheap capture device. And this has been part two of the sprites, animation, and video game series. And if you'd like, make sure to subscribe and click the bell so you can be notified when my next video goes up. And for now, thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye.